Good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Teitz. I'm a professor here at the University of Washington in the Division of Sports Medicine. And uh, we're delighted to welcome you to Orthopedic Grand Rounds from the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. This morning, uh, the topic is uh, ACL graft selection from wide receiver to weekend warriors. And this is a perpetually hot topic, even though that's an oxymoron. Um, we've been talking about ACL reconstruction and graft selection for at least 30 years. Um, and it's still evolving. So today we're going to hear from Brian Gilmer, who's one of our residents, Dr. Trey Green, an associate professor in the department, and Dr. Jason Wilcox, who's an assistant professor in the department. Brian? Thank you, Dr. Tights, everybody, for coming on this uh, classic Seattle morning. Our talk is going to review some of the history of how we got to where we are, what the current literature shows, our future directions, and also review the uh, individual graphs, which are commonly used now. Um, and then we'll introduce Dr. Uh, Green and Dr. Wilcox to talk about those things in a little more detail. That being said, there are no disclosures uh, relevant to any of the topics of this presentation. I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, Dr. Hagen, Dr. Larson, Nicole Patrick, and Dr. Uh, Wall for providing some of the clinical photos. Uh, that are in this talk. I'd like to start out with an audience poll just to see if you were to undergo an ACL reconstruction tomorrow, what graph would you prefer on yourself? And this is assuming that you are you and not uh, Tom Brady here in the picture. So uh, can we see some hands for quadruple hamstring autograph? So that is a big chunk, maybe 25 to 30 percent. Bone patellar tendon bone autographed. Two hands, one very emphatic hand from Dr. Chapman. Uh, quadriceps tendon autographed, zero. And uh, bone tendon bone allograft, the four, five, six hands there. And another allograft, one hand there. And I don't know, Dr. Hanel, <laughs> some, some of the other hand staff. <laughs> I'd like to start off with a brief history. Uh, battle in 1900 <laughs> described the first successful primary repair of the ACL. Hay Groves, three years later, uh, reported after observing the tendon himself that it appeared completely irreparable, and he recommended reconstruction with a uh, fascial autograft. And the debate between repair and reconstruction really continued for the next 30 years. From 1930 to 1960, there was debate over whether the ACL needed to be reconstructed at all, as it was felt that the rotatory instability was due to damage to the posterior medial capsular structures and to the meniscus. The idea that the ACL was, in, was a constraint to anterior translation of the tibia had not been introduced yet. And furthermore, people were treated with long periods of mobilization, like Jimmy Stewart here and uh, Alfred Hitchcock's 1954, The Rear Window. And while this may have allowed people to spy on their neighbors, it did not really improve their knee function. <laughs> By 1970, it had become clear that the failure of the ACL led to a functional disability and that reconstruction was indicated. But several non-anatomic extra-articular reconstructions were introduced, mostly aimed at correcting the rotational instability. These involved uh, medial-based repairs like this pesplasty, which is shown on the right, by 1975, the concept of the pivot shift had been introduced and lateral-based repairs had started to been developed in order to prevent what was called uh, anterior lateral rotational instability. These still failed to control direct anterior translation of the tibia, and people were still often treated with long periods of immobilization, resulting in high rates of arthrofibrosis. By 1980, the Lachman test had been introduced and Noyes had published data demonstrating that the ACL was a constraint to anterior translation. And this led to grafts utilizing the quadriceps tendon, first left on the tubercle and routed through tibial and femoral bone tunnels, and later with a free tendon graft. Hamstring grafts, which were initially introduced in the 1930s, were also utilized, but typically as uh, augments in laterally based extra articular repair in place of iliotibial band or weaker grafts. And during this time, synthetic grafts were introduced uh, during a darker phase of the evolution. Uh, Dacron grafts and uh, Gore-Tex grafts were used. These often caused severe inflammatory reactions, 
and generally failed because they did not biologically incorporate it. These were also supplanted by the free bone tendon bone grafts, which were biologically active and underwent ligamentization in vivo. So from 1990 forward has really been the modern era. Arthroscopic techniques were ushered in, uh, allowing intraarticular placement of femoral and tibial tunnels. And this required less dissection, allowed faster postoperative rehabilitation, and moved ACL reconstruction into the realm of an outpatient procedure. So the goals of ACL reconstruction have really evolved from achieving uh, biomechanical stability at all costs towards actually returning people to sport and to starting to measure uh, patient-derived outcome measures. In large part to Dr. Freddie Fu's work uh, over the last several years, a focus has been on restoring the native anatomy. And uh, believe it or not, this is actually still a topic of debate. Uh, Finally, as we approach our second decade of ACL uh, reconstruction in the modern era, we're starting to look at the long-term fate of the ACL reconstructed knee. And so if we could somehow anatomically restore stability and allow patients to return to sport while preserving their articular cartilage, this would be a total win, and it might actually let Ivory finally retire. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we've learned that non-anatomic, non-biologic, non-isometric graphs fail universally. And this history has led to two remaining classes of graft. The uh, autographs, including the bone tendon bone, quadruple hamstring tendon, and quadriceps tendon, and allografts, which include those same grafts from about the knee, as well as other grafts distant to the knee. So we'll spend some now, time now talking about the various characteristics of each of these grafts and comparing and contrasting them. Looking at mechanical strength alone, You'll see that uh, the red line here demonstrates the ultimate strength of a native ACL. It's important to note, though, that these numbers were derived from studies that were done at different times with different techniques and different methodologies. These is, sometimes occurs in orthopedics are numbers which are just perpetuated through the textbooks, and nobody has yet done a definitive study comparing these head-to-head. Uh, -head. The only one that you'll see is lower is the allograph uh, radiated with three millirads of radiation. Early on, we were irradiating these grafts, and it was uh, later found that this caused a structural weakness of the graft. So all modern allografts are typically directly fresh frozen grafts. Starting with the bone tendon bone, um, evaluating the pros and cons. The pros is this is considered probably the gold standard. It has the longest track record because there's bone graft on either end. There's bone to bone healing and therefore faster incorporation. This is a stiffer construct and particularly in the early studies, it was thought that because of the faster rate of incorporation and the stiffer construct that there was a lower failure rate. Unfortunately, the most common uh, complication of using a BTV graft is anterior knee pain. This can occur in up to 20% in some meta-analyses. These patients also have a decreased range of motion and a higher risk for need of a manipulation to obtain full extension. And while rare, there are reports of tendon rupture and patellar fracture, uh, which can be devastating complications. This is a picture of a graft that's harvested uh, through a longitudinal incision directly over the uh, patellar tendon. The ends are shaped into uh, more of a bullet shape to facilitate passage. Uh, the smaller end you see here on the right is the patellar end of the graft, and it will go up the femoral tunnel uh, because it's somewhat smaller. Uh, the grafts are then measured. The bone blocks are approximately two centimeters on each end, and the graft itself is marked. Passing sutures are put through drill holes in each to facilitate passing of the graft. The quadruple hamstring tendon is probably the most common alternative autograph to the bone tendon bone. And the chief advantage is the lower rate of donor site morbidity, better extension and uh, quadriceps strength, as you might expect, since you're not affecting the extensor mechanism. And because it has two discrete limbs, this allows for a double bundle reconstruction. On the other hand, uh, there's more static laxity, uh, as was shown in the previous graph. And there's knee flexion weakness, again, which might be expected since you're harvesting the hamstring tendons. And because the ends are soft tissue, there's a slower rate of incorporation, uh, soft tissue into bone rather than the bone to bone healing. Hamstring tendons are harvested through an incision uh, just off the crest of the tibia, about four centimeters below the joint line. Uh, 
The tendons are often uh, palpable superficially, which can guide the incision placement. After dissection through the subcutaneous tissues, the uh, uh, sartorial fascia is incised, allowing uh, access to the underlying tendons. The tendons are then grabbed with a uh, snap, tagged with a suture, before being cut from the tibial insertion. Then blunt dissection with uh, finger or mayo scissors is used to free fascial bands. There's uh, pretty reliably a band from the semitendinosus tendon to the medial head of the gastroc, and failure to remove that can lead to a premature truncation of the graft, uh, which would make it too short for use in reconstruction. After the graft is all free, a tendon stripper is uh, applied and aimed at the ischial tuberosity and the uh, tendons are removed. The process is repeated for the uh, remaining tendon and the sartorial fascia can be closed. The free grafts are then taken to the back table to a uh, pre-established uh, graft station. Any excess remaining uh, length can be removed and the remaining muscle is uh, scraped off with the bevel of a 10 blade. Grafts run through a sizer to determine its diameter and it's tagged with the loop suture uh, that allows passing sutures to, uh, for passage of the graft. The quadriceps tendon uh, seems was probably the least, uh, the least chosen here among our audience, uh, but it's harvested from a central third of the quadriceps tendon and is composed of two limbs, the vastus intermediate and the rectus femoris. And it can be harvested with or without a bone block from the patella. The available data on the quadriceps tendon graph suggests that its stability, range of motion, and knee scores are equivalent to bone tendon bone, but with markedly less anterior knee pain, 5% in one study versus the 20% we quoted earlier. Uh, it also, because it has the two limbs, allows for a double bundle technique. Unfortunately, the expected problem is quadriceps weakness, uh, which can be as much as 20%, and this can complicate recovery since this is usually predicated on recovery of quadriceps strength. In addition, this is a technically more difficult harvest than the previous two graphs we talked about. It still bears the risk of patella fracture, and overall there's less long-term follow-up data, uh, approximately four to seven years versus uh, 15 to 20 years with some of the other graphs. These photos are of a uh, harvest for a quadriceps tendon. This is a transverse incision just above the superior pole of the patella. Dissection is carried down onto the surface of the patella and the one centimeter width of the graft is measured. A scoop saw is introduced, which takes the bone plug, which is lifted off the patella and tagged with the suture. And the graft is then removed with a scalpel and mayo scissors. The two individual uh, limbs are then tagged as for a soft, uh, soft tissue graft. Allografts. As a group, the allografts have the obvious advantage of having no donor site morbidity. You can choose to have a soft tissue or a, or a bony end on the graft uh, based on which graft you choose. And these, um, as a group, all have faster postoperative rehabilitation because such a significant percentage of recovery is related to donor site morbidity from graft harvest. This faster perceived recovery can be a liability as these patients who feel better may be prone to go back to sport more quickly. This combined with the known slower incorporation rate of these soft tissue grafts is what uh, some authors suspected was the source of the higher failure rate. Again, this is independent of uh, the irradiation problem we mentioned earlier. And finally, there's a risk of disease transmission as with all allografts, though this is small, approximately one in one and a half million for HIV. Perhaps the biggest uh, controversy around allografts is the cost. And while the literature is conflicted, the argument essentially boils down to higher personnel costs for autograph and higher supply costs for allograft. So Cole in 2005, he felt that autograft was more expensive because of the increased operative time and the increased post-operative pain that resulted in longer PACU stays and uh, potential for overnight stays. The study was redone more recently in 2010 by a different group in an ambulatory surgery center and they felt that when you remove the risk of an overnight stay that uh, allograft became more expensive just due to the cost of the graft itself. And then most recently Dr. Swinkowski's group in 2011 at the TRIA Center in Minnesota 
uh, demonstrated that likewise they felt allograph was more expensive but their increased operative time was only 12 minutes which depending on which resident you're working with may be more or less than that. Ultimately the difference in cost may be center specific as the OR time and the uh, cost of the allograft varies by geographic location and by individual facilities. And the cost of the, for an allograft at the university is $1,500 for an Achilles tendon and $1,800 for a hemipatella. And these are somewhat higher than the mean values that were quoted in some of these studies. So looking at outcomes, uh, how do patients do after their ACLs? By far the most data is available on bone tendon bone and hamstring tendons. Uh, it's beginning in about the year 2000, a series of meta-analyses came out, really one every year or two, and these had wildly different uh, results and findings. Uh, Younes in 2001 found the BTV to be stiffer. By 2004, Spindler had decided that there was no difference, and then a year later, Chadwick decided that the hamstring tendon was actually stronger based on newer fixation techniques. So this begs the question of why, if these meta-analyses were looking at some of the same studies and using some of the same available data, were they coming to different results? And Pullman and his group published this paper on overlapping systematic reviews of ACL reconstruction and asked the question of why. And they went back and looked at all of the primary data and suggested that there was really a wide variation in the rigor of the methodologies of the data that was reviewed, as well as, the, as, well as that of the techniques that were used by the individual surgeons. Uh, while the early studies seemed to favor bone tendon bone, the later studies seemed to uh, favor hamstring tendons. And so the question really remained unresolved. This led to a Cochrane review of uh, 19 studies on almost 1,600 patients in 2011. And this included only randomized controlled trials, published and unpublished data, and it showed no difference in knee score or re-rupture rate. Again, this is only between bone tendon bone and hamstring tendon. Uh, they showed that overall the bone tendon bone was more stable, but with more anterior knee pain, as was expected. There was the flexion weakness with hamstring tendon, extension weakness with uh, bone tendon bone. So looking at quadricep tendons outcomes, again, as we mentioned previously, there's less data that's available. But overall, there's, there has been shown to be equivalent to results to bone tendon bone at two years. The, the anterior knee pain rate of 5% compared to 25% in their study. And this was regardless of whether the bone block was harvested, which is relevant as several people think that maybe harvesting of the bone block is the actual painful portion of this. So looking at allograft, after we removed the irradiated grafts that had a higher failure rate up to 30%, it was shown that allografts could have equivalent results to hamstring tendon at two years. However, there was one significant study published on bone tendon bone allografts specifically, which has changed the way some surgeons think about this. This was a study done comparing bone tendon bone in young active patients uh, compared with those same allografts in older, less active patients and compared to patients who had autographs, so three limbs to the study. And they showed a two to four time higher likelihood to fail in the young active allograft group. And this led some people to suggest that allograft should only be utilized for older people who are presumably lower demand. Long-term knee health. As we mentioned, the ACL is frequently not an isol isolated injury. There's often chondral injury, meniscal injury, and results in extension lag, which results from the post-operative or even the non-operative stiffness. In relation to how graft applies to this, Pinchuski study, uh, published a study in 2011, and he suggested that bone tendon bone grafts had a higher rate of arthritic changes in the medial compartment. These didn't show up at his 10-year study as dramatically as they did between the 10 and 15-year study. And since this is one of the only studies with that length of follow-up, uh, there is concern that perhaps the bone tendon bones have a higher rate of arthritis over the long term. So where do we go from here? In the future, because of the methodologic problems we've had with the existing data, two new studies are in their collection period. The Moon Multicenter Orthopedic Outcomes Network and the Mars Multicenter ACL Revision Study.
And these are uh, gathering data on studies across the country from uh, different centers. But they still have some of the problems that we've had thus far, namely that there's no way to standardize where the tunnels are placed or how the actual procedure is done by an individual surgeon. Um, and also, as you see in the pie graph in the center, the lion's share graphs are still bone tendon bone and hamstring tendon autographs. Quadriceps tendon and allografts uh, are a remarkably smaller piece of the pie, so this may not answer our question of how these compare. So what do we know? Well, there's no free lunch. The few things we can say for certain are that the bone tendon bone is likely to cause anterior knee pain. Hamstring tendons are likely to cause flexion weakness. The quadricep tendon is still a bit of an unknown, and allografts have a higher re-rupture rate, but have a, a higher rate of uh, post, a faster rate of post-operative recovery. What are our patients telling us? In this era of uh, widespread use of the internet and more savvy and sophisticated patients, we might find ourselves with patients coming to us with a specific graft in mind, saying, hey doc, I, I know I want a hamstring tendon. And 50, in one study uh, done recently, 51% of our patients have done research on ACL grafts, and 41% of that information is from the internet, which makes you question how accurate that information is that they're getting. Fortunately, the number one patient factor in graft selection is still surgeon preference. So it begs the question of what are we as surgeons doing? And while this graph is not actually a distribution of uh, ACL reconstruction <laughs> graft, this is actually the electoral map from the 2008 election. But anecdotally, it does reflect the geographic variations that you see in graft use, particularly their tends to be higher use of bone tendon bone in the uh, red or central part of the country in the south with higher use of hamstring tendons on the coast, east and west coast. So ultimately, who you see may determine what you get. And with that being said, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Wilcox to come forward to discuss allografts in more detail. Most of this is going to be hard to talk about really any of these topics without uh, some degree of overlap, and Brian did such a good job. Uh, we're going to maybe touch on a few of the salient points for allografts. So um, the nice thing about what we do, or perhaps the detriment of what we do, is you can find evidence to back up almost anything we do, which means that we're both right and wrong uh, simultaneously on every case that we do. Um, the one thing that you uh, can say about allograft is the biggest advantage that I think most people agree on is that it's not yours. Um, all the morbidity associated with getting this graft has occurred prior to you getting it in the operating room. Uh, the best benefits, of course, are the no donor site morbidity, which Brian touched on. The graft size, which becomes a little more important with soft tissue harvesting, is that uh, the graft coming out of the freezer, your, your allograft is the size that you want it to be. You know it's going to be a 10, you know it's a 9, you know it has bone on it, whatever you want to do. Particularly in soft tissue uh, harvesting and hamstrings, someone perhaps on the size of Dr. Tights, you may not get the size hamstrings that you could get from Allograft or something like that. We're just saying you stay very fit and petite, Dr. Tights. So, or time, obviously, um, Brian already talked on that. Um, it really depends on how quick you are in harvesting, which um, can make up for the cost of the Allograft versus how quickly you sow, how fast you harvest, and closing whatever your donor site might be. Um, looking at the Downsides of uh, patellar tendon, uh, and something you have to tell your patients when you're considering allograft versus autograft, is anterior knee pain. Now, again, you can find studies to suggest that allograft and even hamstrings will have a uh, high incidence of anterior knee pain as well, but generally the literature supports um, a high rate of anterior knee pain going with uh, patellar tendons, which makes sense based on where you're going to be. Um, and then osteoarthritis, which again Brian touched on. Uh, now, again, medial compartment uh, disease versus patellofemoral, you see that in both, how much of that has to do with chondral damage. Again, that's a weakness in our literature that hasn't been able to ferret out uh, quite as much of how much was chondral, how much was perhaps harvest, how much was your poor rehab and not getting your extension back. Uh, one of the more recent reports in uh, last year, a single surgeon who did every other case with uh, patellar tendon and hamstring found that half of his patients had moderate to severe uh, arthritis at five years. Uh, compared to only 17% uh, of his hamstring group. So this is, um, even though it's the, the gold standard in the literature, this certainly let other people want 
uh, a different graft. The left is wanting for a different graft, and hamstring is being probably the, no, the most common option uh, outside of that. Uh, Coombs and Cochran, uh, however, reported that this strength deficit that Brian talks, uh, spoke on earlier as far as your knee flexion strength was still persistent at one year, and this is where their study ended, but it isn't enough to say that, oh, you have pain and you're going to have weakness in flexion. This may actually be permanent, uh, which can have implications on depending on the type of athlete, whether they're a uh, runner, sprinter, wide receiver, something along those lines. Um, slower graft incorporation, as far as hamstrings go, has more to do with the uh, soft tissue nature. Um, Brian had mentioned again the uh, bone healing to bone at a faster rate. Now this usually occurs in most reports around four to six weeks versus soft tissue can be six to eight weeks out. And again in the era of everybody wanting to get back to sport fairly quickly, advanced rehab, this could actually have implications on how quickly you push someone um, to get back to sport. Quadricep tendon, there's just been fewer studies um, on what its downsides are. I mean you saw the graph that Brian put up that that very small green part of the pie. The biggest disadvantage to quad tendon at this point is that we don't know. It does have more theoretical disadvantages that a patella fracture can still occur. The superior pole of the patella, however, is a little bit thicker. And again, the, the way that it is harvested by certain people, including Dr. Green, lessen this risk, but you can't uh, make it zero. Uh, quadriceps tendon rupture, again, is probably a theoretical uh, disadvantage, but uh, to my knowledge, hasn't been reported yet. And so while the clear benefit of Allograft is that it's not yours. Its greatest disadvantage is also that it's, it's not yours. Um, some of the problems associated with allograft are cost. Again, as Brian had mentioned, slower incorporation uh, for a number of reasons, which we'll get into. And then disease transmission is probably the one um, asked about most commonly in your clinic and certainly a concern to your patients. Uh, regarding the slower graft incorporation, uh, Nicolau was uh, evaluating the uh, histology in uh, revascularization of allograft, and at 16 weeks, the autograft appeared to mimic that of the uh, normal native ACL, whereas when looking at the allograft, this took 24 weeks, uh, which is certainly sooner than what most people are going to go back to sport, but the difference between four and six months may end up making a difference in your rehab. Um, uh, looking at uh, Jackson and colleagues, uh, we're looking at uh, the native patellar tendon. Um, as well as a native ACL and looking at the, the fibrils cross-sectional area and what you are hoping to get to. And so in their population, they used all patellar tendon autograft and allograft, which is in the top left corner of your screen. Uh, and then on top right is your native ACL, so hoping to go from top left to top right. When they got to six months, uh, the patellar tendon allograft had much larger uh, fibril diameter, much smaller cross-sectional area. They seemed to have a prolonged inflammatory response, edema, and essentially less strength even at six months as compared to um, autograft, which you can see, although certainly not normal to a, a native ACL, is in a point of transition between the two and showed greater strength um, and uh, load to failure at six months than an allograft. Again, the, one of the biggest concerns for your patients that you have to tell them about is the disease transmission for allograft. Now, um, thankfully, these are rare, and, and Brian told you the now what is considered the, the risk of disease transmission, at least with HIV and allograft. There has been one case of HIV reported, um, which is certainly one more than anybody would want if it's you, um, and two cases of hep C. Now, both of these occurred. Uh, HIV was in the mid-'80s, and then 91 were the two reports of hepatitis C. Now, graft procurement as well as the uh, standard sterilization process has changed since then, uh, so now most reputable tissue banks and the organization that actually represents all these recommend routine serologic testing of hepatitis B, C, HIV, uh, human T cell leukemia uh, virus, as well as bacteria. Uh, they also recommend that you're harvesting within 12 hours of uh, um, uh, for graft procurement um, from death. And all of these are uh, thought to lower the risk, and since the time that we had noted, they have not seen any disease transmission since this point. Um, about it. We're going to ask Dr. Green to come up and talk about his thoughts on ACLs. And so I'm just going to talk about just a brief uh, practice principle, some considerations for tendon harvest when they include bone, and then talk about my approach to uh, the ACL 
uh, graft and how I've come to select what I do. Even the best trained graduate is going to quickly get out of date if you don't continue to learn. And so you have to continue to look for the cumulative knowledge of both the, uh, your colleagues through the meetings and the literature, but also look to see what's working in your own practice. So things that work for your mentors may or may not work as well for you. So whenever you take a graft uh, from the patella with a straight blade, you have to go past the, the point of your uh, graft just a little bit, and that creates a stress riser. And so there's some potential for uh, a fracture propagation after that. The second big issue with using a straight blade is that most of the folks, and I, even the videos that you see up on the uh, OKO now, as far as the techniques for harvesting these things, include the use of osteotomes to finish your graft harvest. And so in my mind, using an osteotome to bang out that last little bit of your graft is just like taking a mallet and hammering on that patellar cartilage, which it just, it hurts me to, to think about that. It's just got to be a part of the, the, the knee pain that we see after some of these grafts. And so in my opinion, that's maybe part of the knee pain problems are related to get graft harvest techniques and not necessarily the, the graft itself. The scoop saw uh, on the right of the picture there is able to harvest a cylindrical bone block. And so you can do that without an osteotome. And the benefit is you even have a graft that's already kind of shaped the way you want it right after you've uh, done your saw cuts. So my training is in the, in the Midwest, in the, in the red states. And so I learned how to do patellar tendon autograph. That was kind of the main thing I did in my training. These are some of my mentors who, uh, who, who taught me that. And so when I started my practice at LSU, I did exactly what I was trained. I used patellar tendon autograph for basically all my primary ACLs, and I used allograft for revision and multi-ligamentous reconstruction. At the same time, uh, the residents from LSU were getting some sports experience over in Jackson, Mississippi with uh, Buddy Savoy and uh, Walter Shelton. And it's a picture of uh, Walter. Walter was doing some quadriceps tendon bone graft ACLs at the time, and the residents were just uh, telling me, you know, how slick that was. And, Maybe they were just commenting on <laughs> the difference between Walter and my surgery. But at any rate, uh, the, uh, I, I ran into a patient with anterior knee pain. And then I started thinking, well, gosh, I got I to gotta learn how to, how to do this graft. So I learned how to do it. And the reason why you know, this sort of thing made a little bit more sense to me was, well, 70% of our ACL tears come from non-contact injuries. So that means that you know, the patients with their own muscles are tearing their own ACLs. So with the knee in somewhere between 10 and 30 degrees of flexion, you plant your foot to cut the other way, you develop a big uh, quadriceps force on, on your knee, and uh, your quadriceps then fire big and bam, tore your ACL. But, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, the, the more uh, adducted your leg is, the more valgus you have, and so the more moment you have to, uh, to tear your ACL. So, you know, one of the big things about tearing your ACL is that most people tear it with their own quadriceps, ten or the quadriceps muscle. And so it seemed to me that okay, if this muscle is part of the problem, part of the, part of the injury, then taking a portion of this tendon during the period of time while it's weak seemed like a good idea. And we do know that after you tear your ACL, even if you don't have any operation, your quadricep muscles are weak for a year after that. 
So I'm going to invite the rest of the panel up here for answering questions. Thanks, guys. That was good. I have a quick question. Um, in regard to the literature, two things. One, we know that most sports, when they're compared male versus female, there's a higher incidence of ACL, ACL tears in women. And also, there's a higher percentage of non-contact tears in women versus men. But when you look at the studies that look after the graft's been placed, and then you're assessing what graft is best or trying to, or what graft tends to rupture more, I didn't hear anything about any gender difference in those studies. So. I'm wondering if that is looked at or if it's not looked at, that seems like a pretty significant deficiency in terms of trying to understand what's best for somebody. And then the other part of that in terms of graft choice is that most of the time it does seem like, as you alluded to, Trey, the surgeons tend to go with the graft that they know best, which makes sense. I mean, if that's what I would, I would not ask you to do something you didn't think you were very good at. But if I was doing, if I was doing my own research, well, if I was doing my own research and I came in with more of an idea about what I wanted, I'm just wondering, how, how much do you, re really, how much do you push patients towards something based on your experience, or would it be more appropriate to send them to somebody else if that's really what they want to do? But most importantly, if you're looking at the research of graphs that fail, I want to know, of the people doing those procedures, what was the surgeon's choice? In other words, if someone for some reason started to do patellar tendons and then mix in every other one hamstring because they wanted to compare the two, but they truly were, were more comfortable with patellar tendons, I would expect the patellar tendons to do better because that's what the surgeon is better at. And so I, I don't get any sense the literature considers what the surgeon preferred to do. Uh, that's, a, that's a great observation, John, because totally you can see exactly that in some of the papers. So some of the papers that have compared these things have compared, and I'll, I'll use the study that, uh, that that was mentioned about the arthritis difference. Well, this is a, exactly what happened. This surgeon was doing patellar tendon. He decided to switch over to do uh, hamstrings. So this is a study that was basically retrospective for the patellar tendon and then prospective for the hamstring. And it turned out that, well, he thought the hamstrings had less arthritis. So. Yeah, you got to really look at that, and I think that's, that's a problem with the literature, for sure. But to answer the second part of your question about, well, what do I do when somebody comes in wanting a graft? If they want hamstrings, I don't try to talk them out of it. I just tell them that I don't do that, and so I send them to one of my partners who does. I mean, that's pretty simple. I think from my end, I don't have a much in the title of the talk was, you know, athletes to weekend warriors. And in, in my practice at the VA, mine is more former warriors. Um, so when they come in, I actually sell them more on complications. Because um, to me, um, at least in my group, they're not trying to go back and play for the Patriots or whatever. They're just, they have maybe a little bit more pain. They're coming back from battle, whatever the case is. And I tell them what you saw on the slide. Here are the things that can go wrong which of those are you okay to live with, and then let them choose the graft. And to me, that's what they get, so. Dr. Connor. Would you answer the question about gender? So specifically, uh, you know, in the reviews, there, there is not any, um, there, there's not any gender difference in failure as far as that we know. Uh, hi, I'd like to make a comment uh, in response to Jason's comments about uh, disease transmission with allografts. First, a uh, couple comments. First of all, all patients should understand they're getting an allograft. The studies that you refer to about disease transmission are with a greater risk of hepatitis C actually occurred in our university department um, from grafts that were distributed from the Northwest Tissue Center, which I am the medical director of, and at that time, the testing changed from uh, higher level sensitivity testing uh, from what was previously lower level sensitivity testing, and that testing generated, uh, that new test generated a look back procedure, and then the look back procedure, many patients, uh, almost half of the patients were unaware that they had received an allograft at all, which is a little sobering. At the time, we were arguing about whether hepatitis C could be transmitted in a tissue graft like this at all. Uh, 
Uh, the study involved uh, amino acid sequencing of both the virus in the patient and the virus detected in the graft with 100 percent homology, so the argument was over with about whether disease like hepatitis C could be transmitted in an ACL. Uh, and I think the most sobering thing was that people just were not aware of the, of the, of the issues associated with allografts and with where the graft came from uh, in terms of a supplier to the surgeon. So I think the, the uh, hallmark features for being careful about allograft as a choice for a graft with these patients is that they understand that there is a disease transmission risk uh, associated with allografts and that they specifically consent to that um, prior to their surgery. So I'd be curious to see what comments you have about that. Thank you. Dr. Goldberg. Good morning. Uh, Brian, I, I want to thank everyone for a terrific uh, conference. Brian, I go back to your first slide in which uh, the audience was asked, if we had an ACL, what graft would we pick? Uh, that suggests that everyone who has an ACL has their only choice is a which graft. <coughs> is ACL reconstruction n not indicated ever? I would say absolutely. And I think, I mean, you need to actually speak with your patient to see what they're, you can certainly jump in here, but I, I talk to everyone and say there's plenty of people who don't have ACLs that are running around. I mean, this is relatively new in the world of human evolution, so I'm not sure most of the patients are willing to wait around. Oftentimes they have knee pain, they go to the doctor, they get a MRI these days before you see them. I don't have an ACL, that must be my problem. I would like you to fix it. Now I think it's our job to tell them, no, you don't need one. This is usually what gets corrected when we fix them. You may have the complications that we have there and then they can choose to see which, which they, way they would like to go. At so least that's me. patient choice? In, in my world, it's patient choice. Um, I assume that's the way in everybody else, but I tell them most of what you heard here as well as you don't need them. People have been running from tigers since the dawn of man, probably without ACLs. Perhaps those are the ones who were eaten by tigers, I don't know. Um, but at the same token, it's, this has happened, we've just been rebuilding these relatively recently, so no, I don't think you need them. So, so how do you tell the residents when not to do an ACL? Oh, well, in my world, that happens probably more often than yours. Um, usually when they have a hard time fitting in the door, um, actually, maybe that's not appropriate, but it's, you know, to me, it's all symptom-based. Are they having instability? Um, and you really have to ferret that out from, is it quad inhibition, is it pain, or is it true instability that's getting in the way? Now, some of the old criteria used to say, it's like, oh, it has to be sports-specific. Well, occasionally, it's sports-specific, maybe. I mean, there's been people who come in that they feel their knee gives out when they're turning a corner with a vacuum. I mean, is that a sport? No, but it's something that you need, and if your knee's not going to stay under you, then you may need an ACL. And I think that's what you tell the patients and they get to choose. So. Dr. Wall. First of all, uh, outstanding review. I think that was a great and covered all the bases. I have just uh, two comments. One, I think the last comment was exceptional. Um, it seems as, as all of us get older, we find out that we're worse surgeons, or at least it appears that way. And usually what we find out is that uh, nothing destroys your great results like longer follow-up or operating on active patients. And I, that one comment I would make is, you know, I agree that I think we do far more ACLs than need done. There are countless orthopedic surgeons who tear their ACLs and, and never do anything about it. Many of them are in this room. Um, and the second thing I think we have to think about in getting back to the, uh, the title of the talk to some extent is, um, you know, it's a, it's a whole different ball game from the weekend warrior or from even the inactive person to the elite athlete. And I think you, when you're looking at all the different graft choices, unfortunately, all the people on the panel and, and most orthopedic surgeons, hopefully in this day and age, are not one-trick ponies and have many options available to them because you always have to think about your worst possible complication and your worst possible outcome. And when you're looking at something like the elite athlete, so the NCAA Division I athlete or professional athlete, anterior knee pain is not a deal breaker. There are many people who are playing in the NFL or collegiate levels with anterior knee pain. Um, however, a second ACL tear is usually the beginning of an end of a career. And so if there is a difference between a bone patella ligament bone reconstruction and hamstring uh, with respect to re-rupture, those are the patients that you may want to have to push one way or the other. Um, and so it becomes, and also the, the thing is that the, it's a bit of a catch-22 because the literature um, uh, 
becomes uh, sort of controversial in the respect that uh, because bone patellar ligament bone is sort of considered the gold standard, now it's a less controversial graft in this patient population. Um, so I think that it's, it's hot, often hard to recommend a graft that's not the gold standard if uh, someone is always going to be willing to line up and say, well, if you'd done a bone patellar ligament bone, this might not have happened. So in terms of elite athletes, that's one comment. And the only other comment I have getting back to gender, it's, it's really curious that we don't see um, re-rupture rates significantly different in many studies between males and females. And uh, we've done some of the research here at the institution, but it, it may be that, that getting an ACL tear is kind of like joining a club and it puts you in some kind of a, uh, it, it's almost a symptom that you have some sort of an anatomy or biomechanical uh, forces or neuromuscular forces that predispose one to getting ACLs. And once you've had an ACL tear, whether you're male or female is not the issue. It's that you have that predisposing set of factors. And so our graft choice may or may not impact whether or not someone gets a recurrent tear. But great presentation. Thanks very much. Along those lines, we should also say that Dr. Wall is actively involved in looking at what those anatomic features might be. And we'll have an upcoming article in the uh, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery soon. Dr. Schmalley. Just a, a couple of comments. Thanks so much for a great presentation. Uh, I'm going to go get myself a scoop saw. It's a great <laughs> idea. Um, so in, one thing I've noticed with the hamstring patients, you mentioned that the uh, potential complication or drawback is the weakness in knee flexion. I just want to emphasize that it's knee flexion in hip extension that it's most most prevalent, and I see sprinters comment, they, don't, they can't kick their buttock anymore when they sprint, and it's really affected what they perceive to be their, their speed. And, um, and, I, and I haven't read that often, but I've seen it in quite a few patients. So that's one comment. And the other would be, you, um, Jason, made reference to Jackson's study and the edema that's noted around the, the um, allograft reconstructions. And I, I have a number of patients who've had allografts and they have a persistent knee swelling, an effusion that's not accompanied by instability, that's not accompanied by pain, that maybe it's a low grade reaction or rejection to this, you know, non, not self. Uh, and I just wondering if you all had seen some of the, th these as well. Thanks. So the idea of rejection is interesting. I wish Chappie was still here. But as far as I know, there's never been a case of rejection of an allograft uh, tendon used for ACL. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you're seeing. I, uh, it's you called. Seen swelling, though, that, that I haven't really seen persistent swelling in, uh, in my patients, no that uh, after you get your muscles rehabilitation, I think a, a, a little swelling until your quads are rehabbed is pretty usual. But after that, then no, I haven't seen that difference. Have, have you, Jason? Well, I mean, my follow-up is currently, what, a year and a half now. And so uh, I, I can't say that my patients have this or that. Of the ones that I've done this on, which I have probably a significant allograft population based on who I'm operating on, I haven't seen the effusions past when they actually got their quads back when their thigh circumference was similar to the other side. Um, that doesn't mean I won't see it soon. But. Dr. Henley. Brad Henley, I want to follow up on Dr. Goldberg's questions in regard to patient choice uh, for operative versus non-operative treatment of their ACLs. How should a patient approach an acute anterior cruciate deficient knee in terms of the decision making of whether or not that individual should pursue an operative uh, correction or non-operative, meaning that how long should that patient rehab prior to really <coughs> undertaking a decision to decide whether or not that deficiency is really functionally impairing? Can I answer that? Oh, please. So uh, it's a great question, Brad. Um, there, there is some, um, as far as I know, there is one good non-operative treatment uh, rehab for ACL deficient knees. It was developed in Iowa. It's a pivot shift control program uh, developed by uh, uh, John Albright. Uh, it is a very intense program where you teach a patient to um, fire their hamstrings when they feel the pivot shift. So it requires a patient actually recognize a pivot shift and then <clears throat> be able to uh, 
go ahead and, uh, and do the hamstring work. Very labor intensive, but uh, is actually very successful. <clears throat> Interestingly, if you do it in regular people, about 15% of folks can do it. If you do it in athletes, about 85% of folks can do it. So the better your neurologic wiring, the less you need surgery, which is sort of not exactly what the current thinking is. It's, it's opposite. But it's interesting, but, you know, where is that? Where can you do that rehab? Well, because it's so specialized and intense, it's, uh, it's not offered very many places. And so if you want to have it, there's only a couple places you can go get it. But in my opinion, that's really the, the, the only way that you can really get a good result with the ability to go back to cutting and pivoting sports. So if you don't have that option, then you do the usual rehabilitation, which usually takes a couple of months. Then you have a choice. You have your choice of whether or not you're going to sort of be a straight ahead person and avoid change of directions quickly. And if you do that, very few people have activities of daily living that cause them instability from their ACL. So your chances of having instability and needing an ACL reconstruction with that is, is really low. But if you do want to get back to cutting and pivoting sports, then that's pretty risky with the sort of usual rehabilitation after this kind of uh, injury. I'd like to take a second now to see if we change anybody's mind. We'll uh, pull the audience again one more time. So uh, same question, if you were to have ACL reconstruction tomorrow, assuming, uh, as Dr. Goldberg uh, pointed out, that you would have an ACL reconstruction tomorrow, uh, would you, who would choose a hamstring autograph? I think that went down a little bit, maybe half of the people. And a bone, tendon, bone autograph? Still a very emphatic Dr. Chapman and Dr. <laughs> Jenkins. Quadriceps tendon autograph? Can we sell anyone? All right, and uh, bone tendon bone allograft? Uh, more allograft takers now, okay. And other allografts? Okay, so a couple hands for that. All right, uh, finally, I'd just like to ask one quick question. Is uh, Dr. Wong still here? No, it looks like he steps out. Okay, thank you for coming. <laughs>